So hi everyone, it's Neeraj Rao. I am the faculty of Indian history, which includes the ancient medieval art and culture, and also the part of modern Indian history. So a little bit of introduction about myself, uh, uh, that I am teaching this subject from last 12 years, and I have been associated with some of the major institute of UPSC civil services preparation, that is, I'm one of the founding faculties of the Vision IES right from the inception. I'm associated with them. And then I have traveled all across the country, including some of the big academies in the South India, Rajkumar Academy, and then Narayana Residential Academy. I have taught in Ireland. I have taught in Dhe. I have taught in Subaranjan IES. So, so many other places. Uh, I had a very vivid experience. About this session, this is, uh, this session is all about the discussion of this year, civil services prelims paper, and particularly the paper of the Indian history. In this particular part, we will be discussing the ancient and medieval questions, modern Indian history questions, and art and culture questions. Then, as far as this year paper is concerned, paper was a little tougher. Particularly the questions which were there, they were highly factual in nature. Overall, paper was on a tougher side. And history was not a saving grace also. So, <laughs> though, though, though uh, things could have, could, uh, you could have solved some of the questions, but not going by the previous methods of the elimination. This time UPSC has completely stumped people when going ahead with the previous uh, way of attempting the paper. So, uh, the new type of the questions which were there that how many pairs are correct. It was altogether a very different experience and people were stumped because of it. So let's get started with the explanation of all these questions and total 13 questions were there this year. So let's get started with the very first one then. So the very first question, as it says that in which of the following regions was Dhanya Katak, which flourished as a prominent Buddhist center and the Mahasangika located. So first of all, to address this question, we can go ahead with this answer that it was located in Andhra, but that's not enough then. Let's talk about the Mahasangika. The original development in the Buddhism or development of the division in the Buddhism, it altogether started from the second Buddhist council. Second Buddhist council in which Buddhism got divided into two sects, that is Thavirvad and Mahasanghika. So uh, this particular Buddhist council was held in 383 BC. And then the next Buddhist council, which was there in 250 BC, which was patronized by Asoka. So at this point of time, these two branches of the Buddhism, Thavirvad and Mahasanghika, they have been further divided into many branches and some of them got consolidated also. So it was Thavirvad which was considered to be the original sect or orthodox sect of the Buddhism. This sect was patronized and promoted by Ashoka and Mahasanghika were not promoted by him. So that is the time when Mahasanghikas started relocating in the different parts of the country and majorly in the Andhra part. So Dhanya Katak, which is mentioned in this question, was originally Dharani Kota area in Palanadu district of Andhra. Then, and here, the seven branches of the Mahasanghika developed. And moreover, this Mahasanghika was, this, uh, was the branch which gave rise to Mahayan Buddhism in the later times by the fourth Buddhist council. So it was one of the major center of the Buddhism and all, it also included in, uh, in and around this Dharani Kota was Amravati, which was also one of the major center of the Buddhism in this particular age. While other options which are there in this question, Gandhar, Kaling, and Magad. So Gandhar particularly, it is known for one of the Mahajanpad, okay? Mahajanpad of 6th century BCE. Kalinga is the one area which Asoka, which Asoka wanted to annex. And moreover, Kalinga uh, led to a very heavy bloodbath during Asoka's time. And it's exactly 261 BC 
when this battle between Asoka and the people of Kalanga, Kalinga has happened. As far as Magadh is concerned, so Magadh was the most strongest. It was the strongest Mahajanpad of that time. Let's move to the second question. That second question, this is all about the first question. So you can go ahead with the Andhra as an option. So we can move to second question. Now, so with reference to ancient India, consider the following statements. The concept of stupa is Buddhist in origin. Stupa was generally a repository of relics. Stupa was a votive and commemorative structure in the Buddhist tradition. So first of all, they are asking question about the stupa, emergence of stupa, what it is meant for, and uh, then there are some keywords in it. Then, so first of all, when we talk about the original tradition of making stupa, it can be traced to the Vedic period. It is not at all related to the Buddhism. The original concept is based in the Vedic religion. So how it all started? In the Vedic age, you must be knowing that there were n number of the rishis, sages, who were known for going into meditation for a very long duration. They can meditate for two months, three months then. And this meditation was often happening in open area. Okay? So open area. So whenever anybody is meditating in an open environment, so what happens? that a heap of sand gets collected over his body. And that's exactly the meaning of the stupa. That stupa means heap of sand then, or a mound. So whenever these ancient rishis and sages, when they were do doing the meditation, so this heap of sand in stupa formation got collected over their body. When they moved out of their meditation, they had a different sight, a different type of the insight, different things to share with the people and also they were enlightened their followers considered this as this as an very important stage to getting enlightened and whenever these rishis or sages their death has happened so their followers started cremating them in stupa formation even till this date this particular tradition continues in hinduism the people of north india and particularly some parts of the eastern india they must be aware with one term mitti lagana then so the day when the last rites happened and the next day people go to the Samshan Ghat and that particular graveyard, then crematory ground, they will be uh, taking some of the remains of the person and then there would be one formation which will be created on the body, which is called as stupa formation. So it is still followed in the Hinduism. So the first statement, the concept of stupa is Buddhist in origin. Now it becomes wrong. Then the second is stupa was generally a repository of relics. This is something which is right. That when the person is cremated, so on his body, when the when this particular mitti lagana process happens, then or particularly people doing some kind of soil stuff on the body in a particular semicircular shape. So this is what is called a stupa, and stupa includes, in general way also in Hinduism, it includes the relics of the people. So it is a repository of the relics, which is a right statement. Then stupa was a votive and commemorative structure in the Buddhist tradition. Now understand the third statement, which is given, votive. So votive means that something which can be kept inside a <coughs> bigger architectural infrastructure. So for example, that in Ajanta and Elora, you will find there are stupas inside the chaityas. So these stupas which are inside the chaityas, they are called as the votive stupas. And what is commemorative structure? Commemorative structure is something which is created for celebrating the victory. So stupa is not something about celebrating the victory. It is all about the ideals of the Buddha, his life, okay? and moreover, what he wanted what he wanted his followers to do, that can be better represented by stupa. So in this particular question, we have only one right statement, that is statement number uh, two. Okay? So statement number two, stupa was generally a repository of relics. Then, And uh, so the answer would be, I think that there is a, some sort of discrepancy over here then. And discrepancy, it has written B, but answer would be only one. That is, stupa 
how many statements so only one statement is correct that is stupa was generally a repository of relics okay let's move to the third question with reference to ancient south india korkai pompuhar and musiri were well known as capital cities ports center of iron and steel making shrines of jain tirthankars so look at the the name of the things which are mentioned in this one korkai pompuhar and musiri it is all related to the sangam history of south india the sangam period which ex, which was which was there in the south india in between 2nd century bce till 6th century ad in this duration three big kingdoms in south india emerged that is chola chera and pandyas then so chola chera and pandya since all of them were the coastal cities the coastal kingdoms and these coastal kingdoms owned huge income by selling many produces to the arabian world and to the roman world so they were obviously there is a need of the ports and in these all three kingdoms there was development of many ports so when we talk about the very first port which is mentioned in this one korkai so korkai was the most important port of the pandyas then and it was located okay so it was located in the lower side of the tamil nadu then the second which is mentioned pompuhar pompuhar is also known as puhar and it was in modern times it is known as the city of kaveri patnam then it was created on the mouth of river kaveri and it was most important port of chola rulers when it comes to muchiri so there are different spellings which are given in the different books about this particular port so some places uh, particularly the british books then and then english books which has been authored by some imperial historians so they wrote musiri as m u z i r i so there was a bit of confusion among the students that what it is but whenever you are in any sort of confusion look at the hindi wordings which are mentioned so it is musiri so musiri was the most important port of cheras and moreover this is one port which is still surviving and in fact in the recent uh, past it was given the status of the first green heritage port of india so these were the three important ports and they are not the capital cities they are not the centers of iron and steel making and shrines of the jain tirthankars let's move to the fourth question so which one one of the following explains the practice of vatta kiruttal as mentioned in the sangam poems then so vatta kiruttal so this is this is a tradition with which is known all over india with the different different names then let's start with one of the practice of this vatta kiruttal in jainism okay vatta kiruttal is basically that starving oneself to the death then the same sort of process is also there in the jainism then the jain monks they jain monks many a times they suggested people that if one is so much of worry is there because of the the deeds one has done in this life so they can go with the extreme penance that is salekhana salekhana in the process of salekhana the person who practices it he starves himself to the death then and in fact some of the historical examples of the salekhana include the maurya king chandragupta maurya who relocated to shravan belagola in karnataka and performed salekhana he died in a typical jain fashion so vatta kiruttal is also very similar it has been mentioned in the sangam poems then so sangam poems basically they can be traced to the period between 200 to 400 uh, 200 to 600 ad and it were these were the results of the three sangam assemblies which were held in and around madurai moreover in this sangam poems okay what they have mentioned that they have mentioned the political exploits of these all rulers chola chera and pandyas and in some of these poems the what the kirutal practice is mentioned so now understand that if a king is defeated and he does not dies in that particular battle so then it was considered that dying in a battle is a best form of death then and the valor was quite appreciated in the tamilkam society 
So those kings who wanted that their valor must be appreciated, but they have been defeated in the wars. So they sacrificed their life by starving themselves. So as you can see, that is exactly similar to the Salekhana. And there were other processes also, even the Sangam poems also mention that those soldiers who are defeated and they, they didn't die in the war, so even their bodies were cut from a sword before going ahead with their funeral process. So this is the number four D is the answer. A king defeated in a battle committing ritual suicide by starving himself to death. So we can, we can compare it with the Salekhana also. I would add one more fact into it. This process, though it seems to be there from the ancient India, but there was something in the medieval India also. In northern part of India, particularly in the Rajput kingdoms also, it was the tradition, or not everyone followed, but the tradition was there. When women are going for the Johar to safeguard their dignity and honor, so men were also like this, that when they are surrounded by the enemy and there is no chance that they would be surviving. So in these situations, they also performed one such ritual, which was known as Saka Pratha. And as per the Saka Pratha, the kings and the soldiers who are about to get defeated, they killed themselves. One of the big and the, one of the very important example is Raja Hamir Dev of Radhambur. When he was surrounded by the army of Alauddin Khilji, so that's the time when he has gone to top of his fort where there was a Sivale. In Sivale, he took his sword and he cut his own head in front of the Sivalinga. So this is also very similar to Vatta Kiruttal. So all over India, if you look out for the examples, this was there. The people were sacrificing their life if they are defeated in a battle and just to go ahead with their go ahead with that, that their legacy must be celebrated in the society. So let's move to the question number five. So question number five is considered the following dynasties. Hoysala, Gahdaula, Kakatiya, and Yadava. How many of the above dynasties established their kingdoms in early 8th century AD? So they are asking that once again, the same type of question, okay, that how many of them? So you just don't need to tell that which one was there in the 800, uh, early 8th century AD, but you need to tell that how many of them were there in the early 8th century. So as far as the Hoysalas are concerned, then, so Hoysalas are concerned, their area was the Dwara Samudra. Dwara Samudra is the area between today's, today's Chikmagalur and Mangalore, then, so when you are moving from Bangalore towards Mangalore, so that's the way in which the Hoysala kingdom, Dwara Samudra, is there. Then Hoysalas were contemporary of the Alauddin Khilji and they were not in the early 8th century. Then, so they were not in the early 8th century. Then when it comes to Gehdaulas, then so Gehdaulas, the Rajput rulers of majorly from the Banaras area, but they have ruled from Kannauj also. And they were also in 10th and 11th century, 11th and 12th century AD. So 12th and 11th century AD. And moreover, moreover, they, they were known for their confrontation with the Chauhan rulers of Ajmer. In fact, when Muhammad Ghuri has attacked India and he has confrontation with Prithviraj Chauhan, so that's the time when Gahdaula ruler Jaichand has taken the side of the Muhammad Ghuri and in 1192, due to his treachery, Prithviraj Chauhan was defeated. Then, it, then when it comes to Kakatiya, so Kakatiyas were also one of the kingdom in the southern India, particularly in Andhra. And Kakatiya's capital was Warangal, which has original name Orugali. So Orugali was the original name of the Varangal. Some of the important rulers from the Kakatiya were Ganpati Dev and the Rudrama Devi. So she is also celebrated for her valor. And she existed in the 12th century AD. Then the last ruler of the Kakatiya was the contemporary of Alauddin Khilji. 
and it was the last ruler pratap rudra who gifted kohinoor diamond to alauddin khilji to stop any invasion in the kakatiyas so basically kakatiyas origin is also there in 11th 12th and 13th century not in the 8th century as far as the yadavas are concerned how many of the above dynasties were established in the early 8th century ad so yadavas their history starts from the 850 then so 850 and they are asking early 8th century ad which means that right from 700 onwards so in this question none of the kingdoms are from early 8th century ad so let's move to the next one that is sixth question question number 6 so question with reference to ancient indian history consider the following pairs so what is mentioned over here the literary work some of the textbooks are mentioned and then the authors are mentioned we need to identify that which of how many of this are correct okay so which of the following pairs are there so devi chandragupta author mentioned billana hamir mahakavya nayan chandra suri milind panna nagarjun and niti vakyamrit somadev suri so first of all the very first book devi chandra guptam was authored by vishakha dat this is a story which deals with the biography of the second gup third that one of the very celebrated gupta ruler chandra gupta second and in line of the gupta rulers so chandra gupta first then samudra gupta and then there was a one uh, the, there was a tenure of rama gupta and finally chandra gupta second so chandragupta second's life story is mentioned in this one in fact devi chandragupta also deals with the story of the uh story of the fight of the chandragupta second with the sakas and the defeat of the sakas then so it also has a love triangle which has been mentioned in this one then when it comes to hamir mahakavya this is a right one so devi chandragupta was not the right uh, pair because bilhana is the author of the book chor panchasika which is a love poetry the second one hamir mahakavya written by nayan chandra suri so it's a new text in the sanskrit poetry and this is a right option and this hamir mahakavya is associated with once again the same thing the story which i was telling you raja hamir dev of radhambhor who was contem contemporary of alauddin khilji who sacrificed his life following saka pratha so this is a right pair then the third one milind panna so milind panna written by nagarjun then it's not right milind panna was the historical conversation between between indo greek ruler milandar who later took the title of the milind and his conversation with buddhist monk nagasen and milind was asking many questions to nagasen and nagasen gave satisfactory reply to all these questions so this has been compiled in milind panna the author of this was nagasen not nagarjun when it comes to nagarjun so nagarjun was one of the very famous buddhist scholar of that time and moreover he was one of the founder of the madhyamika school of buddhism then or vaibhasika school of buddhism then when it comes to niti vakyamrit then so somadev suri so this is also a right option and in this as we can go ahead so there are two options which are correct let's move to the next question so question number 7 souls are not only the property of animal and plant life but also of rocks running water and many other natural objects not looked on as by other religious sects the above statement reflects one of the core belief of which of the following religious sects of ancient india buddhism jainism savism and vaishnavism so uh, it's a easy question out of all the question which this year came it was one of the easiest question and uh, uh, majority of the books and the resources they have mentioned about it so the answer is jainism let's listen to the explanation that as compared to hinduism buddhism jainism has a different concept of soul on one hand buddhism does not believes in the concept of permanent soul to them that soul does not exist then and they believe in some concept of 
panchaskand which is five type of the karmic consciousness when it comes to hinduism so hinduism believes in the eternal soul which says that soul is permanent then soul ne is not soul never dies it just takes one form to another form jainism says that there are two type of soul and they say this soul is inanimate and inanimate soul in other words it can be said that jeev soul and ajeev soul so jeev soul is attributed to all the living beings but the ajeev soul is attributed to all the other things which are non living so in this case rocks running water and many natural objects let's move to the question number 8 question number 8 i would say that it is moderately tough then it is a very factual question it depends that how much study you have done how much study you have done but one more thing is to be uh, is to be said at this point of time that if you look at the upsc paper last 7 8 years we have got continuously at least one or two questions from the vijayanagar kingdom so this question did not came out of blue if one is observing the last 10 year paper and this is my recommendation that one must go through last 15 year paper of the upsc prelims examination in fact there are a times when many questions are repeated i have seen many a times that many questions are repeated and at the same point of time you also get a hold of that what kind of questions upsc is asking from where it is asking so one of the very important chapter in fact if i have to say in last 10 year so i have seen seven questions from vijayanagar kingdom in the prelims examination so then more emphasis can be given to this particular topic so as the question says that who among the following rulers of the vijayanagar empire constructed a large dam across tungabhadra river and a canal come aqueduct several kilometers long from the river to the capital city so the capital city of vijayanagar was hampi and it is the vijayanagar ruler devaraya first who was there in 1410 and he was the one who created 24 km long aqueduct from tungabhadra river which was reaching to the capital city okay so capital city so it is moderately tough uh, question but not very tough and if you go by the previous year papers you could have got inside and you could have studied it and you can you would have solved it easily let's move to the question number 9 who among the following rulers of medieval gujarat surrendered due to the portuguese it's an interesting story that how portuguese got due as far as the portuguese story is concerned i hope all of us know that those who are watching and they are upsc aspirant i would say not all of us but yes those who are preparing for the upsc so they know that the first european to come to india following the direct sea route was portuguese then and it was vasco da gama who landed in india in 1498 may 1498 calicut in kerala he was welcomed by the zamorin rulers of the kerala and then after the trade relation between portuguese and the keralites started to develop there were ups and downs also so for example that when the vasco da gama has returned back and then after another sailor has come to india whose name was pedro alvarez cabral he had some sort of confrontation with the zamorins but when vasco da gama once again returns so he further establishes his connections with the kingdoms which were there in the kerala so by 1505 the portuguese government realized that they will not be sending their private the private sailors to india but instead they will send their official envoys to india and these official envoys were led by the portuguese viceroys the first viceroy was de almeria followed by albuquerque and then followed by uh the next important one okay we are not saying that next uh, voice roy but the most important in this series was nino da cunha now last year also in if you see last three year paper so there has been one more question last year i think exactly last year there was one more question related to portuguese that is the capture of the goa which happened in 1510 when albuquerque was the voice roy in india 
and he is considered to be the real founder of the portuguese power in india but after alba cork the next important viceroy was nino da cunha who was in between 1529 to 1538 and it is during his tenure that dew was captured uh, by the portuguese from bahadur sa of gujarat the story goes like this that in northern part of india babar has died and humayu has ascended the throne humayu humayu had to face the confrontation on many fronts and one of his confrontation was with bahadur sa of gujarat at this point of time bahadur sa enlisted the help of the portuguese and he ensured them that if he wins the battle so he will be handing over due to the portuguese but since bahadur sa was defeated by humayu so he did not handed over due to portuguese portuguese were offended by it and they invited him to one of their ship but this was for altogether different purpose bahadur sa was thrown from the ship to arabian sea and that's how portuguese captured due so it was captured from bahadur sa let's move to the question number 10 by which one of the following act was the governor general of bengal designated as governor general of india once again it is one of the easiest question of the paper anybody could have done it then and even a class 8 student could have done it so i don't think that it is a difficult question and this is a saving grace then this type of the question in such a difficult paper is a saving grace when the questions from the other sections of uh gs paper are difficult this is not at all difficult so anybody could guess it that it was the charter act of 1833 so <coughs> this particular act has led to the centralization of the indian politics all the civil military economic powers were concentrated in the hand of the governor general of india william bentick was the first governor general in 1833 and moreover moreover he was the most powerful governor general till this point of time so as we said that it was a watershed moment in the indian history because it led to the con- uh, centralization of the indian administration all the powers got concentrated in one hand and moreover the further authoritative regime happened at this point of time so it is a easy question that is charter act of the 1833 option d let's move to the question number 11 with reference to indian history alexander rea a h longhurst robert seville james burgess and walter eliot were associated with so this is a difficult question i would say that this is a difficult question and for this there is a need of very extensive reading but the point is that how much extensive reading you can do just for one question if you run after one book and another book so this is not something which will augur well for preparation and just getting emotional about one question will cost you many questions and in history there is no limitation there is no limitation to read how that n number of the books you can read n number of the books but please always remember that this exam is more of a generic it is more of a generic exam and less of a specific exam so you don't need to do phd in this one as it has said that general studies not a specific studies so this question is difficult if i would be at your place so definitely if i if i don't know so then it's better to leave this particular section but anyways it is a discussion so as far as these people are concerned alexandria h longhurst robert sevel james burgess and walter eliot all of them were associated with the archaeological task so some of them were archaeologists some of them were commissioners british commissioners and some of them were officials british officials but all of them were involved in some of the projects of the archaeological excavation so for example they were involved in the archaeological excavation around amravati around sangam dynasty areas then then moreover the they were also in archaeological excavation they were also tasked with uh, inferring the details from the coins and the signage and then also inscriptions so all of them okay some of them were archaeologists some of them were british officers some of them were british commissioners all of them were interested with the archaeological excavations let's move to the next question consider the following pairs so 
what is mentioned over here a site is mentioned on one side and uh, well known for is mentioned on the other side so what are the sites which are mentioned very first one is uh, base nagar and in front of it is mentioned sevite cave bhaj it is mentioned buddhist cave shrine sita navasal jain cave shrine so it asks that how many of the above pairs are correctly match so two pairs are correctly match that is two and three let's talk let's let's discuss a little bit more when it comes to base nagar so base nagar has many names okay and these names are base nagar is also known as bhilsa then so it is also known as bhilsa and in modern time base nagar is known as vidisha so if any of these name comes so that is base nagar only moreover it has a very important historical aspect there was one greek ambassador who has come to india at the time of the sunghas and he converted to hinduism and then he was the one his name theodorus so he was the one who erected a pillar with the name of lord vishnu and this pillar is famously known as garud dhwaj so garud dhwaj and it was dedicated to lord vishnu it was the first archaeological evidence of worship of lord vishnu so it is not a sevite this cave shrine but it in, in fact it is a that vishnu shrine then dedicated to lord vishnu and the name of the pillar at this place is the uh, garud dhwaj so only two pairs are correct let's move to the next question consider the following statement statement 1 7th of august is declared as national handloom day statement 2 it was in 1905 that swadeshi movement was launched on the same day so they are asking that which one of the following is correct in respect of the above statement so it's been time that this kind of question has been asked previously before 2011 the these type of statements were asked but in last 11 12 years upsc hasn't asked this type of the question but this year they have gone ahead with this type of the question so as it said the 7th of august is declared as national handloom day so it is in 2015 that the current regime or the current government it declared 7th of august as the national handloom day and the statement too says that it was in 1905 that the swadeshi movement was launched on the same day it is also a right statement that it is on this day that 7th of august 1905 swadeshi movement was launched so originally the declaration of partition of bengal is the reason behind swadeshi movement it was viceroy karjan who declared the partition of bengal on 19th of july on 19th of july 1905 and after the declaration of this particular partition of bengal on the lines of the religion led to the beginning of the swadeshi movement so in this particular question statement 1 to both are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation of the statement 1 this is what the government of india did to commemorate this particular swadeshi movement they started national handloom day on 7th of august 1915 so i think that these are the questions which were there in the paper so total 13 questions are there in the paper and as you can see that modern indian history questions are very less in number in fact this last question it is less of a modern but more of a current oriented question then the modern question could be that uh, only william bentick question that is 1833 charter act and also the question which was about the portuguese can be kept in the modern category <coughs> then when it comes to art and culture and ancient medieval so 10 questions are there from this section and moreover in upcoming few years you can expect increasing number of questions from ancient medieval and art and culture in fact from last 2 3 years the questions of the modern are not to uh, are not very great five questions seven questions they have asked so overall it can be said that this paper particularly the section of the history was moderately difficult it was not very difficult overall <coughs> the paper was difficult paper was difficult when it comes to the section of polity science and technology 
environment, everything. So it was difficult, but it was moderately difficult. And uh, uh, the last things which I would say to you that please go ahead with the previous year paper and acquaint yourself with the type of the questions which they have asked. You will get a great insight that which area UPSC is emphasizing. And accordingly, you can reorient your preparation. With these notes, I'm thanking you. Goodbye.